also known as, and now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, I'm actually uh, glad that I'm in this session and not the volatile se session because at the end of this, people are probably going to want to say, give us a number, give us how much water or hydrogen you're seeing, and we're not quite ready to say that. So I'm going to talk about everything else. Uh, <clears throat> so the Cosmic Ray Telescope for the Effects of Radiation on LRO, crater, in the mode we're using it, detects protons with energies around 100 MeV. Now we call these albedo protons, but some people prefer the term splash. You might call them secondary protons, whatever you want to call them. These are not reflected off the moon. These are produced by galactic cosmic rays, very high energies, hundreds of MeV over a GeV, hitting nuclei in the regolith, breaking them up. And because these protons can travel through about 10 centimeters of regolith before they get stopped, that's how deep roughly we're seeing into the regolith, about 10 centimeters. Uh, at these energies, magnetic anomalies are not having any effect, just so you can forget about those. Uh, now, we are, I'm going to show that we're sensitive to hydrogen in the regolith, but we are not sensitive to its form. In other words, for example, if we irradiated equal portions of H2 and O2, with cosmic rays, it would look identical to us as if you radiated a bunch of OH with cosmic rays. All we're sensitive to is the relative elemental abundances, not the, the, the chemical form they're in. Uh, chemical bonds are relevant. So in, in a sense, the way to think about, about this is, from, from the perspective of a galactic cosmic ray, the moon is, it, it, or an object like the moon, is a giant sphere of uh, widely separated nuclei, and the cosmic ray enters the object and at some point it'll hit a nucleus and cause a collision and off you go. Everything else is kind of ir irrelevant. <clears throat> so there's three types of collisions that happen, at least that we're going to talk about here. The first, uh, in, in, the, in the first case, whoops, uh, in a process we call nuclear evaporation, it starts with a peripheral collision where a cosmic ray makes a glancing blow on a heavy ion. It excites the ion and when the, when the uh, I'm sorry, uh, on a nucleus. It excites the nucleus, and when the nucleus de-excites, it emits uh, protons, neutrons, and other nucleons in, in isotropically in random directions. This is the one process that can produce um, albedo particles traveling straight up out of the lunar regolith, because the directions of the, these albedo particles don't depend on the direction of the incoming cosmic ray. The next two types of collisions intranuclear cascades and knock-on collisions, both of these types of collisions eject particles more or less in the direction of the incoming cosmic ray. So an intranuclear cascade is kind of like a bowling ball taking down bowling pins. You might get one or two nucleons coming back in the direction the cosmic ray came, but for the most part, the target nucleus gets disrupted and the fragments fly off in the forward direction. And then a knock-on collision, well, that's just like two billiard, bar billiard balls colliding on a pool table. One, one hits the other, stops, goes, and again, four direct, four directed. So this is the one diagram I'll show of the crater instrument. Uh, it's we have it's composed of six detectors arranged in three pairs: one, two, three, four, five, six, separated by two pieces of tissue equivalent plastic. And this diagram just shows sort of our nominal orientation. We call this the zenith nadir orientation. And cosmic rays and albedo particles are traveling through the instrument from all directions at all times. <laughs> The, but the, the only time we can know what direction a particle came from and the identity of the particle is if it passes through two or three of the detector pairs. And so it, when we map the moon and calculate yields, for the most part, we're looking at particles that travel through both D6 and D4. And so when you project the possible trajectories that can register that way, it forms a 65 degree wide uh, cone like this. So this is sort of a diagram of our nominal nadir zenith field of view. And all the nadir particles we sense have to come in from this cone. And again, because these particles have to come mostly from the nadir direction, when we're in this nominal mode, for the most part, at least as far as we know, we're seeing particles coming from nuclear evaporation, that first collision type. So it's ironic that the one um, really albedo yield uh, result we have in the bag and published actually involves a two-step collision process. So this is a plot of the yield of albedo protons coming from the moon versus latitude. 
Here's the equator over here, and here's the average of the two poles. And then this, this, uh, the vertical axis is the yield of albedo protons. The yield is roughly 1% higher at these high near polar latitudes compared to the equator, 1%. <clears throat> Not big, but for us that's significant at this point. The, the easiest way for us to explain that is as follows. Yes, nuclear evaporation is still a primary process happening uh, right below the surface as usual. However, at high latitudes, there's an additional thin layer, few centimeters of hydrogen. And here's what's kind of neat. The uh, nuclear evaporation is also producing albedo neutrons, which we don't detect. But if a neutron collides with a hydrogen nucleus, also known as a proton, near the surface, the neutron stops, the proton goes, and we see additional protons due to the hydrogen. This is just the flip side of the coin of what happens when, you, when a neutron detector sees water. A neutron detector sees a reduction in neutrons when there's hydrogen in the, in the surface. We're just seeing the flip side. A neutron stop, protons go. <clears throat> uh, now, if there is a surface layer of hydrogen, <clears throat> there ought to be, if we could see them, some of, the, of these hydrogen nuclei, some of these protons, scattered at grazing angles by galactic cosmic rays coming in at grazing angles. So if a cosmic ray comes in at an angle like this, it could directly hit one of these protons and knock it off at a low angle, but at an angle that we normally don't detect when we're in nadir viewing mode. The second thing is, obviously, surface hydrogen makes you think maybe there's a diurnal variation. So the trick then is to try a new uh, horizon viewing mode that can uh, detect these uh, low angle protons coming off the, the moon's surface. And that's what we've started to do. We started this <clears throat> campaign in uh, 2015 of taking horizon observations. And I'm going to show you just the 2015 data for now. Uh, we took all these observations over the Oceanus Procellarum longitudes uh, in May and November of 2015. This now is a diagram of the field of view when, when we heal the spacecraft over. Our 65 degree, degree cone is moved over until it just kisses the horizon or limb here, and we don't want it to pass over that because we'll start getting cosmic rays coming directly up down the pipe, and then we don't know what we're looking at. So we want to make sure we're only seeing albedo particles coming in now at a different set of angles. And, and also, we only observed over the terminator. So about half the data was taken at, at uh, local sunrise and half at local sunset, so 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And this, I just want to remind myself, in case I missed anything, yeah, so at any, any given point on the moon, or, moon or, or over any given period, yield is simply the number of detected albedo protons divided by the number of cosmic ray protons. And we also make sure to not include any data which happens during solar particle events because that's a very different um, spectrum of incoming particles and they, they may or may not even produce uh, albedo protons. So we make sure to reject data during solar particle events. Uh, very briefly, this is one way to plot raw data from the crater instrument. Each of these plots is simply a measure of energy deposited in one detector versus energy deposited in a second detector. And in each case here, the protons fall along this trail here. And, but there's also, as you can see, lots of noise to either side of it. We call that scruff. The good news is it falls off exponentially so we can uh, fit it and subtract it. And the, see, the problem is there's going to be some scruff events right under the proton track. So we have to subtract that out to know how many protons we're looking at. And we do that by collapsing each one of these two-dimensional plots into a one-dimensional spectrum. And the red dots now are the data. And this bump here, that's the proton track. And we fit, the green line is a fit to the background scruff. We subtract the green from the red, and we get the blue proton-only spectrum. So here's for cosmic ray cases, albedo protons. Here's for the more abundant uh, albedo uh, nadir zenith data and the uh, more sparse horizon viewing data. And, whoops, I skip, hello, there we go. Uh, I have a lot of numbers here. I just want you to focus on the four numbers that are bold and colored. Uh, morning sunrise is blue, evening sunset is red. So what's pretty amazing here is if you just look at the the nominal nadir viewing mode, already we see a very large difference between morning and evening. The morning 
Proton yield is significantly higher than evening. That means this thin hydrogen layer that we already think we detected at high latitudes, it in fact is far more abundant in the morning than in the evening, which is kind of what we'd expect. Maybe not numbers wise, but qualitatively, for there would be more hydrogen uh, on the surface just before sunrise. And then the very cool thing is, when we look at the uh, new horizon data, the yield contrast is even higher. The yield of protons when we look over at the horizon is even larger, and that's because we're seeing now not only the uh, nuclear evaporation particles emitted all directions, and then some of them converted, some of them converting neutrons into protons, but also now we're seeing evidence of cosmic rays directly hitting these uh, protons, hydrogen atoms at the surface, and adding to the yield. Again, only when we're looking at the horizon and grazing angles. Thanks. So uh, this is a summary slide, pretty much saying the same thing. Again, if we just stopped right here, that's already an amazing result. This 35% contrast is the highest contrast we've seen in any data analysis we've done uh, of mapping yields. But then we look at the horizon, the yield is actually twice as high in the morning as evening. And perhaps most importantly, this means that any mapping we do from now on, calculation of yields, we have to first account for this diurnal variation, the proton yield, which presumably also is related to uh, variation in the hydrogen content. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Okay, any questions all the way in the back? Oh, my gosh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering, um, at what altitudes can you measure these effects? Oh, you mean, mean from which altitudes? Yes. Well, um, I can tell you for sure that you can measure them up to altitudes of, say, 200 kilometers. That's the, the most distant point of LRO's orbit. Um, I don't see why you couldn't measure them from much greater distances. It's just a question of um, how far away you can go before the trajectories of the albedo protons start to to get uh, curved by the B field and the solar wind. They would, that's pretty much it, yeah. So they could still contribute to SCE rates of spacecraft in lunar orbit? To, what is the term used? For single event effects? Oh, um, well, uh, that would depend on what the absolute yield is. Again, just based on the ratios we're doing, we're seeing slightly fewer albedo protons coming off per incident cosmic ray uh, proton. Um, so uh, in, in that sense, I, th I would think that the cosmic ray and solar jet particle, particle are still probably, they're more numerous and more important, but yeah, that's just a first, first guess. Yeah, Thank you. sure. Diane Wood and NASA Ames, do you see a contrast between when you go over the poles and not over the poles? Uh, well, I, um, beyond the latitude trend that I showed you, um, the answer is not really. We did at one point do, we tried a high resolution map of just the polar region and it was just static. So at least at that point we didn't have enough data. But we do want to start again mapping everything, now also taking into account time of day in case that there's particularly higher contrast right before sunrise. So uh, we may see something when we do that. Yeah. Hi, Judy. Uh, uh, I know your field of view is big, but uh, can you tell the time difference on morning and afternoon, like at the evening, the time difference between morning to noon and uh, evening to noon? Uh, you mean, mean it, basically you're asking, have we done this at noon? Is that? No. Okay, so you said you have uh, um, morning data, right? Yeah. So what kind of time on the morning? Is it 8 or 10? Oh, I see what you're saying. What time of day? Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, it roughly spans from about uh, 5.20 to 6.40, and then uh, the, the same uh, a.m. and then the same uh, p.m. At, at sunset. So yeah, it spans a little more than an hour local time. So 5.20, that's still before the sun rise. Uh, that's right. That's true. And okay. yes, we've, people have already asked us, to separate that out to look just look only at the half before the sunrise and see if yeah, it's even exactly. more. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want to see. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, one last question. I'll be back up front. Um, in that in that one percent slope plot, uh, you had some dashed lines that represent the the, the error for the, the the south pole versus the north pole, or what what were those? 
Ah, this, uh, you know, that this is an average, so this is, so here at 30, that's both north and south 30, and here is, that's both um, uh, minus 60 and plus 60 average together. Okay. So, the, now this is, um, these lines here were the statistical argument we were, we, we were making to say that this is significant, even though these error bars are rather large. I see. Yeah, I that's, see. Okay. yeah that's all it is. Okay, any other questions? If not, thank you, Jody, and we will move on to our last